So, are the new God of War games actually as good as you remember them being? I mean, we have the uh, critically acclaimed God of War 2018 and the more recently released God of War Ragnarok have both gone on to become absolute commercial hits. But now that their release primes have passed us, do they still hold up after some time has passed and with a little more retrospect? God of War is a franchise with two very distinct eras, and each respective era attempts to strike a very different tone in terms of its storytelling, narrative, themes, gameplay, and emotions that it wants to convey, but maintaining the heart of what made God of War a cultural gaming icon in the first place. Weirdly enough, it's it's not really like you have like an old trilogy and a new trilogy evenly divided, you know, kind of like how Star Wars is, for example. Just focusing on the main films for a moment, whichever era of these films you favor, they're at least fairly balanced as far as entries in the series go. You got the original trilogy, the prequel trilogy, and the sequel trilogy. Now, keep Star Wars in mind uh, because it's actually going to be relevant in just a second, but God of War has its original trilogy, plus a few extra games on the side, uh, a, a few handheld devices, and even on mobile. But fast forward to now, let's call it the new school God of War games only have two entries, in which really should have been a trilogy. But this video isn't going to be much about the old games. I'm going to dedicate an entire other video to those ones specifically, and I'm going to attempt to avoid comparing the new games to the old ones only where necessary or when I need to make a point. Uh, but I want to focus on specifically God of War 2018 and Ragnarok, and I want to explore the question of, are these games actually quite as good as you remember them being, or as good as everybody claims them to be? After all of the initial excitement and the dust has settled, I guess we'll see. I mean, I clearly, I am the end-all, be-all expert on correct video game opinions. I only have perfect takes, and nobody's ever disagreed with me on a video game opinion ever. Never let this guy cook. No, it wasn't. It was good, and exploration was fun. A lot of enemies but made up for it in atmosphere and gameplay. Bad video. Thumbs down. Quit making videos altogether. Your video is so biased, dude. It's clear that you just don't like the game and made a one hour video just to complain. So now that we've established that I'm clearly always right and everybody in the whole world agrees with me and not a single person has ever had a slight difference in opinion, we can start talking about why the new God of War sucks. No, I'm just kidding. And I'm also kidding about everyone agreeing with me. And if that wasn't inherently obvious, well, then you might be dumber than the guy who bought diet water. But anyways, this video is going to be a deep dive into discussing the new school God of War titles, both 2018 and Ragnarok, to see if they actually still hold up as well as we remember. Now, going back to Star Wars for a minute, we seem to live in a culture where you have stands and super fans that love everything. As long as the product has the thing you know, you get excited to consume the next product, and this is also where no criticism or other viewpoints are tolerated. Everything presented is met with a hyper-positivity that any dissenting viewpoint or opinion is immediately labeled as being a hater or not being a real fan and it can create this overly positive echo chamber that is blind to any faults or problems. It also gatekeeps any newcomers who might be interested in your thing that you're already a self-proclaimed expert on so that you make getting into that thing feel so oppressive that it further isolates your echo chamber. Now, on the other hand, you also have people who are overly cynical about everything all the time for no reason at all except as a projection of their own pathetic misery onto other people. Folks like this think that showing enjoyment or any positive Positivity to something new or mainstream is repulsive and sheep-like. Being a fan of Marvel or Star Wars, for example, or a new video game in any capacity, you're labeled a brain-dead fanboy. Cynics also tend to tear down the creative and personal achievements of accomplished people, stemming from jealousy that they harbor on account of not having achieved anything noteworthy themselves. Thus, you can end up with an overwhelmingly dim and negative viewpoint from these kinds of people. Reason I bring this up is because most people are not one of these extremes. Even though we like to think of one another as solely in one camp, the reality is there's far more nuance to each person than we realize. Well, usually. And I bring this up because no matter what I say about God of War, there will be somebody that gets pissed off from this video. If I were to be ultra positive, I would get called a, a shill and a brain dead fanboy. And if I'm very negative, I would get torn apart by fans of the game. So what I'm really trying to say is I am but one man with one opinion, and I'm not expecting to please everyone with what I have to say. And if you happen to agree with me, then great. If you disagree, then 
you want, you can call this 1-800 number and you can complain to them that you watched a, a, a God of War video game review on the internet that you didn't like. And I'm sure if you really, really didn't like it, you could call them and say, this video was so bad that it I just wanted to establish some common ground and say that criticism of art or video game is not representative of hatred for it. It is born of a passion to make things and, and see them improve and make them better by calling out areas of weakness. That being said, I do have my criticisms of both God of War 2018 and Ragnarok, but you should know that before assuming that I'm going to ask his something or blindly hate on it, uh, I'm coming from this with the most balanced perspective that I can possibly have. And so in good faith, we can all assume that we won't what's best for God of War as a franchise in a series, but may have a bit of a different opinions about what that looks like. Just as the God of War series and franchise itself has grown up and matured, as have I, and a, a lot of how I feel about it compared to how I used to has changed quite a bit. And if there's something at the core of all this, how God of War has evolved and stuff, it's change. Fair warning, friends. Should you prefer to remain unburdened by foreknowledge of the thrilling adventures of Kratos, Atreus, and yours truly, then turn back now. I find it really interesting that the general community sentiment after the release of God of War Ascension on Kratos was more or less one of boredom apathy and tiredness. God of War had a hugely successful original trilogy, but the Kratos fatigue really began to set in by like 2013 to 2014, and that was where God of War went back into the shadows for a little while. The overwhelming vibe was that they were done with Kratos, you know. Kratos either needed to go away or needed a fresh start. Even though people were fans of Kratos, like the old, same old, same old story that was being told was starting to wear thin. And Corey Barlog and the team knew that people were getting very tired of that same formula, even though they, you know, still had love for him. They just couldn't keep on making the exact same God of War game and not expect any kind of burnout. This like anti-hero who just kills things and bathes in their blood. And I'm like, you need to see a therapist don't want these characters to grow i don't want i don't give a f what you're going through at the studio and i don't mean that disrespectfully but don't take the character kratos or indiana jones and go you know what i'm steven spielberg i'm i'm older now and i'm really into family and i want to tell stories about fathers and sons and god no f you Old Kratos was really about pure rage and violence and chaos. Not to imply that there was no depth to his character, because there certainly was in the writing, but the tone of Kratos was always very clear. He was the god-killing rage machine. Very important context to remember is the old games were directed by a presumably single, young, and childless Cory Barlog, who, you know, has struggles with the father-son relationship that's heavily reflected in the game. New God of War, and the fact that Kratos now has a son of his own, was pretty much completely inspired by the fact that Cory got older, got married, and had a kid in real life. Now, obviously, this would present a real departure in tone, and that's why I don't find it incredibly useful to compare the new games to the old ones very much, at least in, in terms of like where Kratos goes as a character, because they're not really trying to be the same. The intention from the very start was to move away from the traditional God of War style uh, when they started to make these new games, but retain the special heart that made it so unique. Before what we know as God of War 2018, the original developers were working on this project that was basically like God of War in, in space or, or futuristic. There was all kinds of laser weapon tech. There were these like spacesuits. You can just see concept art from it, and it's such an even bigger departure from the original formula than even God of War 2018 was. This project was completely scrapped in favor of starting something brand new, which ended up being God of War 2018. But even this didn't come together very easily either. There were several iterations of different versions of where this game was going to take place and the mythology about it and everything, and while the idea for Kratos to have a child was all still more or less present, it wasn't until they decided to, you know, pin down on Norse mythology that basically Atreus himself was born. But just the whole 
whole concept at face value of Kratos now having a kid and being older and a little different was very weird. And, you know, so, so to people who were off put by the new style of God of War and you know, just to be like the old games, to some extent, I get it. I, I really do. And I empathize with the feeling like having something you loved so dearly that was changed in a really strange way. And on the other hand, I do feel maturing the character and the condition of Kratos was the right move going forward. And while I think this new direction was largely positive for the franchise from the perspective of the big picture, I'm not really convinced that all the decisions were made for the betterment of the video game itself. So big picture, what is God of War as a game? This is a hack and slash action series with some RPG elements complemented by a very cinematic story and narrative that brings it all together. You've got a few components that create this experience in its totality. Additionally, on top of the fact that Sony Santa Monica was being very clear about how this is a departure from the original formula and this is a very different God of War than before. We've changed everything from the combat to the mechanics to including the sun to the environment to everything is, is different, new. And fresh. It's also pretty obvious that the larger goal was to make a highly accessible game for everyone. Now, what does that mean? Accessibility allows everyone from all walks of life and a very wide range of capabilities and skill levels to be able to participate in a video game. And I want to be very clear about this. I'm quite pleased that gaming in a lot of ways has become much more accessible to the average person. This is to be celebrated as far as I'm concerned. You know, the ability to share your passion with others regardless regardless of ability or skill is great, and we need games like that for sure. So I, I don't want to disparage the fact that people who may or may not be the best at video games or super into them, or people who have a hard time with controls or vision problems or etc. Like the mere fact that a person from any walk of life and interest or skill or ability in video games at all can actively enjoy and participate in this experience really should be celebrated. And I don't want to denigrate the fact because we need that in the video games industry. That is essentially what allows it to keep growing and expanding and that's great so I want to be super clear I don't want to downplay the impact of any of that however I do want to recognize that there is a trade-off accessibility lives on the opposite balance of another thing that uh, basically you cannot have one without sacrificing the other the more accessibility you have the more you lose in agency and this is key to understand because many of my criticisms of the new God of War games hinge on this very thing many of the choices is made for accessibility sake extract a terrible cost to player agency and ultimately a huge part of what makes a game fun for me. Case in point, and probably the best example of this, God of War 2018 and Ragnarok have no jump button. While it's not necessarily unheard of in an action game, it is one of those things that have huge ripple effects into the rest of the game with combat, level design, and traversal, etc. And it's worse than you think sometimes. Because without a jump button, you're given only the illusion of choice with the exact same outcomes. Take this as a small example. You need to walk across this bridge section in the intro of Ragnarok. Now, you have two paths in front of you, and you only need to take one. And so, one of them, the player can just hold forward and walk across this log perfectly fine. Great, if you really want to do that, that's awesome. On the other side, there's a gap. Now, if God of War had a jump button, or really if there was any kind of platforming at all, you could try to time and calculate your jump to make it across the gap yourself, giving you some agency. But instead, it's the exact same input. You just hold forward and Kratos makes the jump automatically without you having to do anything different other than if you had just walked across it on the other side. There's literally no difference in what you do or what you input between these two paths. So that begs the question, why is this secondary path even there then? It's an illusion of choice that isn't really there. This would be cool if you could jump so that you could actually have different options depending on how you want to play. If at every possible moment in the level design, you could either choose to take the path of least resistance and, you know, the safe way, or you could take maybe a more difficult but uh, potentially more rewarding way or something that at least allows you to exercise your player agency, you could have your cake and eat it too. Or like this, for example, many bosses have these ground wave attacks. Why can I not choose to jump over these and, you know, be timing them right, awarding good reactions and positioning? The answer? Accessibility and restricting player agency. 
The choice from the developers was deliberately made to trade off interesting and truly interactive level design and navigation with more movie-esque cinematic looking moments. Theoretically, the new God of War games could have a jump mechanic or it could have been designed to have one, but that would require much of the game to be overhauled and retooled and level traversal would be far more interesting and interactive, encouraging true exploration and not to mention would add some real tension in the gameplay. Level traversal is one of the weakest points on the new God of War games in my opinion. Instead of being given a relatively open but still structured level where you can jump and climb and go around to wherever you want to go, sort of like in the older games, they also have a real threat of failure by the way. Both 2018 and Ragnarok, on the other hand, are more or less following these like same colored marks uh, with your controller and just pressing X when it says so. The most egregious example of this boring and tedious level traversal is the giant wall that you climb as Atreus to get to Asgard. There are plenty of other moments in 2018 and Ragnarok where, the, you know, the level traversal navigation becomes a little bit of a snooze fest, but this is crazy. Like, yes, the wall of Asgard is a neat visual, sure. I'll give you that. It looks insane, but realistically, it's like 10 to 15 minutes of tensionless, threatless, sterile, pressing the same prompt to get to the top of the thing. And like, it's, it's even worse because you can't even walk off if you try to. You know, in games like with more player agency, one of the most fun things that we all do is walking off of tall buildings. Like it, it's every gamer's first move when you get on like the giant Empire State Building in Spider-Man or something, for example. It's fun, but they're so concerned with immersion and keeping things on the rails and deliberate that they won't even let you do that. For a much, much smaller gripe, but still relevant to my point, there's plenty of moments where the game forces you to slow down and walk because they're practically making you sit down and just enjoy this beautiful thing they made you know they really want to make sure that you just take it all in now i also want to caveat that by saying that it also has like story and dialogue pacing reasons but or even loading screen reasons but you get my point you know the main thing i'm trying to convey is that many of the choices throughout the game whether it be for you know gameplay ease of use or for narrative reasons are done at the cost of player agency and it's not like it's just one big single thing that kills it for me. I feel like it's death by a thousand paper cuts. Or in other words, it's the culmination of a bunch of little reductions in player freedom that really dampen the potential depth of the experience in my eyes. But once again, they're not exactly trying to hide that fact. I mean, the very opening of both games practically play themselves. In 2018, you only have to hold forward for like the first 10 to 15 minutes. You're almost 20 minutes into the game and you've not really inputted almost anything at all by just holding the stick forward. In Ragnarok's opening, it's a little better for sure. You actually have some quick time events that you can fail if you're not paying attention or being careful, but also, you know, you can control these dogs on the sled, but you can also let it go and these still control themselves on the rails. Like you don't even have to input put anything here. Uh, I don't want to harp on this point too much, but as someone who really likes player freedom and choice and agency, it's stuff like this that I notice and sticks out to me. Once again, I understand it's all done for accessibility's sake, but I wouldn't say that adding accessibility inherently makes something a better video game. Well, hold on, you dumbass YouTuber. Did you even know that God of War games are about the characters and story and adventure? Did you even know this game has Kratos? Yes, I do want to also acknowledge that God of War is not strictly about its gameplay and combat. There is a whole other component of adventure and narrative and story and cinematic storytelling for sure. And that is completely true. I believe God of War as a whole package is genuinely one of, if not the best video game for entertainment through cinematic storytelling. Both new God of War games are an absolute technical achievement. Everything from the acting for its characters, which have some of the greatest talent and spot on performances that a game character has ever been been, you know, able to come to life, to the fact that the game has no cuts at all throughout the entire adventure, this was a big selling point that sets God of War apart from its competition. There are no visible cuts or loading screens or cinematics or whatever that you're going to see as like a, like a hard cut to something else. Yes, there are loading screens and there are cuts, but they're all hidden in very subtle ways that you don't really consciously think about in the same way. This, in effect, leads to an unbelievably immersive and impressive 
impressive way to tell the story. Also, I have to mention the atmosphere, uh, you know, the world and the visuals. Both 2018 and Ragnarok are visually some of the most stunning and best looking games in the whole world. The attention to detail, forethought, masterful artistry that weaves through each and every single inch of these levels could be art pieces in and of themselves. Sometimes you, you don't even have to, but you just want to stop and take a second to slow down and look around and, uh, and absorb the environment all in. These worlds are genuinely artworks in and of themselves, and it's insane how God of War and Sony Santa Monica are actively pushing the boundaries of what video games can really look like. And to say that there isn't real effort and thought and talent going into these, uh, designing these art and gorgeous levels would simply just be disingenuous. Now going hand in hand with the game's focus on accessibility, is also its emphasis on a cinematic experience as well. And I want to be as clear as possible here. I am pleased there are studios that are attempting to reach a very wide audience with no barriers to entry. You know, a very cinematic game every now and again is good. Uh, but I'm not really a big fan of this current trend where developers are leaning towards the methods of storytelling that are more commonly used in cinema and movies instead of utilizing the tools that make the medium of video games unique. Like, there's so much impactful and emotional methods and techniques that can be used in a video game specifically to convey a story or make the player feel some kind of way or tell them something about the plot that doesn't outright involve showing you in a cutscene or anything cinematic. It can be something as subtle as letting a player walk around and discover a weird blood stain that provokes a mystery or a feeling of hopelessness and dread at the end of a journey. And putting you as the player behind the wheel of that can be incredibly impactful. And I'm not saying there isn't any environmental storytelling between 2018 and Ragnarok. There certainly is. But most of what's interesting in so far it's like delivered through the story is done during dialogue or a cinematic moment. And sometimes I feel it may go a little too far in that direction at times. Uh, there are some moments where you get a healthy dose of what I'm looking for, but it's so few and far between that it adds to the feeling of overall reduction in player choice and freedom in exchange for watching pretty animations and movie-like cutscenes. Hi, uh, this is post-production editor Chop. I just wanted to add as a side note, this is also why I think having a God of War movie or TV show would be totally pointless, because the cinematics in this are essentially the movie. Any kind of actual film would just fall short of what the game already accomplishes, because it's cinematic at heart already. I just wanted to add that. Anyways, back to the video. But this is a much different God of War than before, and fair enough. I'm just somebody that really loves video games and I love them for a variety of reasons, but to me, gameplay is always king. A game can have a beautiful and fantastic story, but if the game itself is just not fun, then why not use a different medium to tell it like a movie or a TV show? In fact, that's how both of the God of War games feel respectively. God of War 2018 is structured like a traditional three-act film, whereas God of War Ragnarok is structured more like episodic television. And that will make sense a little bit later when we talk about their stories, but what you need to know is God of War 2018 is one game, and it's got enough story story to tell in said game without stretching or warping much. Ragnarok, on the other hand, really needed to be two separate games in order to properly spend time building up every single plot point and setting without padding them out in parts or having incredibly awkward pacing. The stories in both of these games aren't perfect, and I have a lot of issues with them as it relates to their plots and characters and pacings and, and so on because I'm an internet naysayer, but is it still an absolutely phenomenal piece of storytelling and energy? entertainment in its own right? Yes, of course it is. Both 2018 and Ragnarok are masters in their craft of making entertaining sequences and taking the audience along for a ride and a grand journey that they'll never forget all while having some incredible moments for character development and allowing these very talented actors to display their acting chops in a very unique medium that is video games. But both 2018 and Ragnarok are also very different in many ways too, showing a real evolution even within the confines of the new era of this franchise. And so we'll start by reviewing the one that started it all, God of War. The 
Let's begin with where it all started. God of War opens up with a very different tone and feel to Kratos compared to its original games, establishing right away that God of War has certainly evolved, and this is a very different world and Kratos himself. Speaking of which, after feeling like they kind of reached their limits with Greek mythology, we see Kratos in a brand new land in which we're centered more around Norse mythology, thus creating the Norse saga. And I'm okay with this as a concept as it can be really interesting to see how someone adapts outside of their native culture and environment, and while this may seem like a cop-out to some, the fact that Kratos just simply walked his ass out of Greece to like a, a, a Norse land or whatever, sure, you might think that's a silly premise and I get that, but it does give them new material to build from and stories to tell, and set pieces as well, but the opening is slow, melancholy, and somber. We see Kratos and his son Atreus about to have a proper death ceremony for Atreus' mother and Kratos' wife Faye. The family dynamic is established pretty quickly. Now, something that's always really bothered me about both 2018 and Ragnarok is that we never really figure out the cause of Faye's death. You could argue in 2018 that it doesn't really matter. Faye, for all purposes, is basically a plot device that gets them mobile and started on their journey that is the game. But in Ragnarok, we get far more characterization of her, and hell, like, we even get to see what she looks like, and her and Kratos interact in, in the prophecy and so on. It just always bothered me that in a game where death is quite commonly escapable or preventable in some way, we don't really know why she actually died. Theories are that, you know, she had some kind of disease or whatever, or that fighting Thor made her die slowly or something, but none of this is ever made clear in the game, and the cause of death could have been used to establish some kind of character motivation, but, you know, the fact of the matter is that she wants her ashes to be spread at the highest peak in all the realms, and that's what Kratos and Atreus are setting out to do, thus starting them on their journey that ends up being a giant prophecy in the central conflict of the game. Compared to Ragnarok, God of War 2018 has a much more straightforward and tightly controlled plot and sequence of events. It has a really strong and precise three-act structure that properly builds tension and sets things up and allows Kratos and Atreus to grow throughout their journey. While taking Faye's ashes initially seems like a fairly simple task, you know, walking up a mountain, complications along the way make it far more involved than it sounds. A man named Balder shows up at your house and tries to kill you and find Atreus. After fighting with Balder, you discover that he's practically invincible and he cannot be harmed or even feel any kind of pain and on the way up the mountain while Atreus is learning to hunt he injures a boar that happens to belong to a witch of the woods Kratos and Atreus agree to help her after accidentally injuring her friend afterwards we meet Brock and Sindri two dwarf brothers that don't really care for each other and after climbing up the mountain we find that the self-proclaimed smartest man alive Mimir he actually says that uh Jotunheim is the highest peak in all the realms and that you need a special thing to get there. You cut off Mimir's head to take him with you, Freya revives him, and then you continue off on your journey, and you run into the sons of Thor and grandsons of the all-powerful Odin. Magni and Modi present some trouble, and after this whole intense encounter, Magni is killed, Modi escapes, but surely there are prices to pay for killing a god, especially a grandson of Odin. Atreus falls ill as he struggles with his godhood that he is completely oblivious to. The witch says that she can heal him, but she'll need a heart from a thing in Helheim. But Kratos' new frost axe will be ineffective there. Kratos has to reconcile with his past and dig up the monster that he tried to leave behind. Atreus heals, learns he's a god, Kratos and Atreus get up to what they need to get to Jotunheim, and also finding out that the witch is the goddess Freya, we learn that Baldur is her son, Atreus in his young gamer rage also kills Modi, the other son of Thor, surely catching the ire of Odin, and finally we learn that Baldur and Freya have a special dynamic, he wants to kill her for the curse that prevents him from feeling, and he tries to kill Freya when Kratos tried to give him a second chance but ultimately breaks the cycle. Freya becomes devastated and viciously angry with Kratos. Afterwards, Kratos and Atreus get Faye's ashes to Jotunheim, but also learn of a prophecy of Ragnarok, and how Atreus' given name from the giants and his mother was Loki.
Looking at God of War through the lens of the story for the moment, I think 2018 is exceptionally well paced. It's got dialogue that's excellently crafted, and the story escalation and stakes are clear right away. And there's no ambiguity about it, they have proper payoffs by the end of the story. 2018 has such like a tight grip on that narrative structure, at least compared to Ragnarok, which we'll get to, and this was the advantage of maybe not being able to do literally everything they wanted to add. I feel Ragnarok is a bit bloated and un wieldy in some areas where God of War 2018, speaking purely from a storytelling standpoint, is tight, quick, and to the point. It's a beautiful story in and of itself, the way it's conveyed and the set pieces that complement it through the Norse mythology inspiration is absolutely beautiful, and I couldn't honestly give this any more praise if I tried. I really do prefer the story structure of God of War 2018, and maybe even the story itself more broadly. A big criticism I have of Ragnarok, which we'll get to, is it's hardly Kratos' story at all. I think in 2018, he plays much more of a direct role. He has a lot more to do. His own character development is there where, you know, it, it's been said, but basically Atreus learns to become a god and embrace his godhood, and Kratos learns to become human through the actions and heart of Atreus. It's not trying to be high art, it's not esoteric or abstract as its story, it's a pretty straightforward narrative about accepting your past, grieving the loss of a loved one, becoming better, and opening your heart to it. And this is why I say God of War 2018 has some of the best storytelling in any video game on the planet. It's something that will keep you thoroughly entertained, even through multiple playthroughs. There's so much care, attention to detail, and craftsmanship in the dialogue, and what this means is you're going to get an incredibly adventurous and curated experience and story, but that comes at the cost of the player being able to kind of find the story or tell it themselves. You're here along for the ride to experience a story, not necessarily to direct it yourself. And that's fine, again, if it's done in a really fantastic and entertaining way, which God of War certainly is. I have toyed with the idea and I thought it would be interesting to have a God of War game where maybe the choices that you make really have an impact on the rest of the game and the narrative can go in drastically different directions depending on what you do. I don't think that would ever happen, obviously, but it's just an interesting thought experiment. But I feel like God of War 2018 is very much carried by its excellent story in the way that it's conveyed. Not to say that the gameplay is bad at all, however, I will say it has certainly some real problems, and there are a few flaws that I do feel Ragnarok improved on. While it's a really good take on this brand new formula, it does come with its downsides, and you can clearly tell that this is the more primitive version of the combat and gameplay systems. 2018 and Ragnarok were complete reinventions of the formula, and not just from a storytelling standpoint either. The gameplay systems had a virtual complete overhaul and reinvention to its original sort of build, and I mean immediately, Kratos now has an elemental ice axe, which is basically the complete opposite to the elemental fire blades of chaos from the old games, being more indicative of how much has actually changed. Now I'm going to try to avoid comparing the new combat and game play systems to the old titles because they're not trying to be or emulate those ones. They actually wanted to go in a very different direction deliberately, but it will be relevant to make a few points where I feel like those games got their combat right, and there's a few, you know, key takeaways that we can glean from them. Firstly, you're going to notice that the camera position in the new God of War games versus old, the new one is much closer. It's over the shoulder where the old games were almost like a bird's eye view, certainly very pulled back back and gave you a wide range to like see around Kratos. This is a lot more zoomed in and also is very much focused on what's in front of you, which will be important because much of the combat still does involve enemies that are behind you, which I feel is one of the weakest elements of this game's combat. Not that they couldn't get it right with this camera viewpoint, but it actually does serve as a hindrance for a couple of reasons. This is a problem for both Ragnarok and 2018. So when you're not facing an enemy, all you get is an on-screen indicator that is this little arrow that will either show you if an attack is incoming or like you know some kind of unblockable attack and you'll maybe get an audio cue from your companion that you're about to get hit but I just feel like this is too ambiguous and not enough because I need to be flicking my camera around to see what enemies it is I need to see what kind of move is coming out and of course you can always use the quick turn mechanic but I feel this is like a little bit clunky and it just feels disorienting to be used a lot I've just started manually moving my 
camera instead. But the main problem with this arrow system is you really, it's just too vague. You don't know what move is coming. You don't even know what enemy is doing it. You just get like a random watch out or something like that to tell you when to dodge, but you don't actually have the proper information to really respond to it 90% of the time. This could be alleviated if the camera was backed up a little bit more. This can be particularly annoying with any sort of flying enemy or something that's in the air or maybe even ones that heal others because you don't really know what's going on behind your back. Whereas the original God of War games, you had a basically complete bird's eye view of the entire battlefield and you have all of the information you need at any given time. And that just simply isn't the case here. Now, in all fairness, this over the shoulder closer viewpoint is better for one on one encounters. I think it makes for a more cinematic experience insofar as that's concerned. And it also allows you to focus and read that single enemy better. But like with just about everything, it's a trade off. The one on one encounters are better suited with this over the shoulder viewpoint. But obviously, a lot of God of War is you fighting multiple enemies at the same time, them going all over the screen or an all around your arena. And you just don't have the same amount of information that you would have with a bird's eye view. And I just don't think these arrows and vague descriptions of something's approaching is quite cutting it. That was a little bit annoying and frustrating in both of these games. You know, with all these accessibility settings, I thought it maybe would be cool if, you know, by default, the camera position is actually scaled to the number of enemies on the screen. So for one on one encounters, it's really close for a lot of enemies. It's a bit more far away. Perhaps you could manually customize this if you want. But I feel this is the only way to make both camps happy because there are folks who like the over the shoulder look uh, in the more like standard third person action viewpoint and people that prefer the old classic God of War games with the pulled out bird's eye view. Staying on the topic of combat, uh, let's talk about how XP and progression and skills work in here because it's very different to the original games and I feel it's one of my least favorite aspects of the new God of War, which again, I believe was made for accessibility reasons and I think it actually comes at a cost at the overall depth of the gameplay. So in the old God of War games, the combat had this like performance based XP system where the better you play in an encounter, meaning, you know, the, the more you don't get hit, the higher you combo, etc. The more proficiently you're playing, you will actually be rewarded proportionally to that good play style. And I think that was like one of the best things that they could have had in that because it really gave you an incentive to play well. It gave you a goal outside of just surviving that encounter or killing the thing. You really wanted to play better. And I thought thought that was an excellent incentive because it allowed you to, you know, progress your character even faster for that. And in the new God of War, there is none of that performance-based XP at all. And you might say, hey, wait a second, God of War is trying to be really accessible and having this like skill-based, performance-based XP combat system would be very gatekeeping for the rest of the game. But I don't necessarily think so. Even on like story mode, which is basically impossible to die, I feel like you could still have a flat XP rate per encounter, but even even just having a little bit more XP if you play really well would automatically incentivize you to play a lot more careful and pay attention to the game more because that combined with the fact that there's no other incentive to play well even outside of an encounter if you you know just finish a battle and you're about to go into your next one even if you go in with low health you'll just die restart and have full health and basically all of your runics cooled down as well so there's no reason to even care about that like it's kind of better just to go in and die and reset to get full health anyways. And so these two factors lead to me feeling like sometimes combat in God of War is just about going through the motions and pushing the buttons. You're not even really paying attention to how well you're playing or trying to get better or paying attention to actively what you're doing. And like, imagine if we had a system where you had a little bit of XP based performance, right? You'll get a little bit more experience if you happen to combo and do well, right? And then also imagine if there was something like a battle streak where the more combat encounters you go without dying maybe you get a, a bit of a xp multiplier on top of that or maybe a, a currency multiplier for hack silver or whatever i just feel like the decision was made against that as to not like gatekeep lower skilled players out of it but i don't think it changes the game at all people can still play really easy or story mode and still experience everything the game has to offer i just feel like it would allow slightly more skilled players to progress a little bit faster this also has the horrible side effect of making things like rage stones to a lesser degree but most mostly health stones feel completely pointless in the normal like traversal level design because you just know if you happen to get to another battle and you die you're just going to come back with full health anyways it, it may, maybe you you get smoked two seconds in but it doesn't matter because the next one you're going to get it so the fact that there is no performance-based xp system or any incentive
incentive at all to play well, how does the XP work? Well, it's not really used to upgrade Kratos himself. This actually applies to a skill tree that goes for all of your weapons and your companion. And this allows you to have different passive abilities or even certain combo potential that is only unlocked by using that character's XP to get the skill tree. And so if unlocking things on the skill tree allows you to have more abilities, but doesn't necessarily change the dynamics or core fundamentals of combat, then why isn't there just some kind of XP performance system? I don't understand that at all, and I feel like it's one of the biggest hindrances to the admittedly really fun and satisfying core gameplay. Both 2018 and Ragnarok have just phenomenal combat. Like, it's it's super fun, it's satisfying, the sound design is amazing, it's very flashy and sexy without being too difficult, like it's not Sekiro, but it's not necessarily easy either, and you can do some insane things with the different weapons and there's a incredible combo potential and so on. Ragnarok admittedly has much better combat than 2018 in my opinion. I feel that um, it's expanded on that original formula, it's balanced a lot better, there's more options, and there's even an incentive, while it's not quite a combo counter, there's enough of an incentive to play well in Ragnarok, which we'll get to later. The biggest problems with 2018's core combat, at least in my view, is that runic attacks are heavily misbalanced with everything else. Playing both of these games respectively on New Game Plus, I didn't realize just how insane and overpowered runic attacks were until I played Ragnarok again and realized that they won't just carry me through every single encounter like they will in 2018. Especially given the right runic attacks, that and some beyond broken companion attacks as well, it can completely trivialize God of War's hardest bosses even on the highest difficulties when cheesed, but Ragnarok took some big steps to correct this and runic attacks attacks are now not the only seemingly viable strategy. There are more runic attacks, and they seem to have more tangible felt differences between the two. Because another problem with God of War 2018 is it felt like it didn't really matter my choice of runic attacks all that much. There were a few outliers in some cases where one is clearly just better, but stuff like the, you know, just overpowered frost axe and the heavy runic on that just blew every other option out of the water in God of War 2018, and I did not experiment with anything else at all once I discovered this. In Ragnarok, I was actually applying different ones and, you know, experimenting with what kinds of enemies or situations that it's advantageous in. It just seemed to have a lot more depth than its original inception in 2018. Again, they probably just figured out a better way to do it in their next game, which is why it's kind of a shame that there wasn't a, a third, you know, title in this series, because I felt like they really could have honed in and perfected that formula. So all of your different weapons and their respective runic attacks are all upgraded through the skill tree, which is directly tied to XP, which again does not have any incentive to play well or any sort of performance system. However, Kratos' stats are directly tied to his gear. This includes stuff like armor and, you know, different enchantments or amulets and so on, and most of this stuff is acquired through either defeating bosses or certain enemy types, completing side quests, or even just found through puzzles and the general level design. This is what directly affects Kratos' stats, not his XP. A lot of the really excellent gear in the game can be found by doing side content, going to different realms that are not part of the main story, and defeating stuff like, you know, Valkyries, which happen to be the best boss fights in the game, period. The Valkyries in God of War 2018 are actually the highlight of the game, in my opinion, from a gameplay perspective, and have nothing to do with the main story whatsoever. And it's great because the Valkyries are fun to encounter and battle just on their own, like you'll get a satisfying experience simply by participating in these fights, but on top of that, you get some excellent rewards for fighting them too, and this is where I found myself having the most fun in God of War 2018, outside of like the main story beats of course. This is where most of the real crafted and fun content is to be found. Now the whole UI and layout of all of your gear and weapons and the way that your skill tree is designed and how you can apply new armor and amulets and enchantments and so on is really sloppy in God of War 2018, and it's made only even more clear once you play Ragnarok and that very straightforward UI. UI that allows you to sort gear much quicker. In 2018, you have this like kind of strange rarity color based system where you're comparing different stats and it's not you know, super obvious which one is just the better choice. You have to do a lot more looking around for no real reason other than the way it's designed. I just love God of War Ragnarok's UI for its gear. It's so straightforward and streamlined, and it feels good and organized to interact with. They made the menus in Ragnarok, like, infinitely more user-friendly than 2018. Now, to be fair, I've seen 
way worse UIs and HUDs than God of War specifically, that's for sure. But I just want to say, you know, and point out how much Ragnarok improved on this original idea. Even though this one isn't too bad, it's not the worst implementation we've ever seen. I want to shift gears a bit to level design and puzzles and set pieces and stuff like that because 2018 has extremely linear yet very well designed levels. Now, the lack of a jump button also makes it so that you can't really freeform explore these levels in any kind of like individual way. And part of the reason these levels are so nice to look at is because it's been carefully crafted of where the player's perspective is going to be at all times. Obviously, if you could jump and break the level and kind of look around, there may be some areas that are not quite as polished or look as nice as others. So they don't really allow you to do that. They allow you to see one very narrow pathway for the most part. And that pathway you're in is insanely beautiful. I guess you could say that's the upside, at least to not having a jump mechanic or really any kind of genuine function that allows you to explore a level, you know, where you're going to be walking and seeing and traversing is all intricately paid attention to. And you can't really, you know, deviate outside of those rails a whole lot, if at all. And that allows me to beautifully segue into what I want to talk about next, which is puzzles. And I use the term puzzles loosely because I don't feel I would actually classify these as a puzzle. You know, a, a traditional puzzle requires thought, critical thinking, problem solving, and so on. But without any kind of real tool to platform or explore or jump around, uh, that's like the main tool for puzzles, as it were. And without that, all you have are these like perspective based puzzles where you just need to walk around until you find the thing. Like, it's not really using problem solving in any creative way to come up with a solution. It's like typing in the right things once you find them. And that's about 90% of the situations in this game. I will say Ragnarok has slightly more intricate and complicated puzzles than 2018. But again, even that's stretching it a bit. But most of these aren't puzzles. They're like weird random occurrences that are in the level that are meant to, you know, break up the pace of gameplay temporarily to then allow you to get back into it. Uh, I would actually prefer some puzzles that have platforming and problem solving and using your weapons in creative ways besides like the obvious function of it. And you do have to engage with these to an extent because a lot of the rewards out of these puzzles happen to be things that are pretty f vital in order to progress. Like you can get the apples that will increase your overall max HP or the uh, horns that will have blood meat that will increase your max rage and so on. But moving over to bosses for a moment, uh, I would say God of War 2018 has decent boss fights. Uh, let's exclude the Valkyries for a moment because those are obviously the gems and the best ones in the game, the overall boss selection is not terribly expansive. And the worst thing by far is the incessant reuse of the troll mini boss, which again, in the first encounter, like the first time you fight it is honestly fine. It's decent. It doesn't have like the craziest move set or anything. And there's not a whole lot going on with it, but the amount that it is shown up again throughout the entirety of your journey is like, it's humorous. And it's especially after playing Ragnarok, it becomes even more embarrassing. There's even a moment in Ragnarok where a troll pops out and you just shred it in an instant because I think the developers know that it's kind of a joke. Wow, that was a really exciting opening boss. We just displayed this insane creature, this troll. I wonder what the next thing is going to be. Oh, oh, it's a another troll. Hmm, uh, that's that's kind of weird. Um, but all right, I mean, all right, it looks a little different. We'll kill it. Oh. The next one's also a troll. Hang on a second. Okay, though, maybe, maybe like this is maybe they just live here. Some surely like once we go farther in the game, there's gonna be another troll. Oh, it's two trolls. Uh huh. I, I, okay, this surely this has to be the last. Oh my god. I think this had mostly to do with development crunch at Sony Santa Monica and not being able to develop a more intricate and fleshed out boss. And this had to be copy pasted in a lot of instances throughout the game. And I understand that to a degree. But man, it, like, it, this became incredibly boring to fight them over and over again because they're not a horribly interesting boss just on their own. Uh, and I think Ragnarok does a, a fantastic job at alleviating this issue. There's much more variety, there are more interesting bosses, and 
even the main boss encounters, I would argue, are also better in Ragnarok. I mean, it's not a super fair comparison because there's just so much more of them in Ragnarok, but like 2018 has some great ones. The Balder fights are amazing, the beginning, and even the one in the end. I think Magni and Modi are pretty good, but I think the clearest example of improvement is like the two dragon fights, uh, respectively side by side. One of these have far more interesting mechanics where the other one is just basically a glorified set piece that can also kind of attack you, but not really. These two are just uh, uh, clear as day how to improve on a boss formula. Nithog is also a set piece boss for sure, but it's done in a way where it's not quite as apparent. There is much more to be engaged with. It's far more dynamic, and I think it's just a, a version two, a straight up improvement of this original set piece in God of War 2018. The only big issue I have with a lot of these more, you know, like bombastic over the top moments and set pieces in specifically the new God of War games and like the Norse saga is that like a lot of the world tends to feel like a theme park where like, you know, there's the next big attraction or big thing. And uh, instead of it, it being a somewhat grounded yet realistic world where these more fantastical things can happen, uh, it does have a little bit of that like theme park feel. And I'm sure there's probably a lot of you guys that relate to what I'm trying to say here. And I, I feel like a giant set piece when used sparingly can be very effective, uh, especially when used in the right moments throughout the game. But when it's every single level and you're almost expecting it at a certain rate, then it kind of makes the luster of that particular set piece in that moment wear out a bit. And it's kind of like the Michael Bay effect. When everything is over the top, then it all sort of starts to blend together. And I will be honest, God of War does an okay job at mitigating that, and it's not too bad in either of these games, but it is an issue that I've seen. Uh, but as an entire package, God of War 2018 is a fantastic game and a successful reinvention of an already established formula. Uh, I think the story of Kratos and Atreus learning from each other on their journey up the mountain to Jotunheim and the way that the actors bring these characters to life, I, I, I think is sure to touch your heart. It's got some flaws in its narrative and I could pick apart the plot for ages. Like for example, who the hell blew the horn the one time when we were in the cave from Freya? I think we were supposed to find out that may have been a setup for another game and yes, games plural, because Cory Barlog was going to make more of these, and that was probably going to be a payoff later. And I believe it is a first step, a first step in many, many games that we're going to make. So I could sit here and pick apart tons more plot holes and threads that never got resolved and so on, but I don't really want to. It doesn't matter so much as it still manages to hold your interest and it's entertaining and it makes you care about what's going on from the characters from the second you meet them. I feel God of War 2018 is significantly lifted up by its story because the gameplay and combat, while still very good, leaves a lot to be desired and some room for future improvement in a lot of ways. And whether or not I agree with the choices that were made when designing the game in terms of its story or its gameplay doesn't matter as much as only as long as I enjoyed myself. And I would say about 90% of the time, I was thoroughly invested and enjoying my time spent with these characters and inside this world. 2018 has been hailed as one of the greatest modern video games that has come out in the last 10 years, and I think I would tend to agree with that. It's fully justified, and while no game is perfect, its shortcomings can be pointed out pretty directly, I would still conclude that God of War holds up brilliantly with time. God of War Ragnarok was the highly anticipated follow-up to 2018. However, Sony Santa Monica and all of them there were debating for a while whether they should do a trilogy to fit it all or, you know, just kind of cram everything in one game. And I'm not really sure who made the decision exactly. I I'm sure it was Corey, at least to some degree. But if the person who gets Corey Barlog's coffee also got to have a say in whether this uh, Norse saga is a trilogy or not, I feel says a lot about the state of the game and what they wanted to do with it. Because I just feel like everything is crammed too much into this. Uh, and Corey even said that they didn't want to spend, you know, 15 years making the exact same game. So they decided to just do it all in a single title. 
and the more I let that sit, uh, the more I'm actually disappointed and disagree with that decision. The choice to essentially slam two games of a trilogy into one that has cascading effects that ripple into everything from the storytelling to the narrative and the gameplay systems at large, and I don't think it was all for the positive. For instance, the plot of God of War 2018 is we, Kratos and Atreus, are going to go take Phase Ashes to the top of Jotunheim. That's it. That's the objective. And yeah, there's some characters along the way, but that's largely the plot. Now, let me try to summarize Ragnarok's plot in under a minute. Near the end of Fimble Winter, Kratos and Atreus return home, fending off the ambush of vengeful Freya. Kratos and Atreus are about to the ladder of Atreus' destiny. That night, Atreus is magic when he's going to be a giant 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 I'm sorry, I don't know where that came from. It's all just simply too much. There's too much stuff crammed into this game. Now, don't get me wrong, much of the story and plot is absolutely incredible, and I think the way it's presented is extremely entertaining, and it will grip you throughout the entire story. It's a lot longer than God of War 2018, but that's because there are, like, seven different plot lines going on at the same time, with the only, like, vague thread that ties all of these together is that Ragnarok is coming. Other than that, they're completely disconnected from one another and nothing seems to have more weight than anything else there will be so many moments throughout the game where something grand in the story happens a big moment a, a step forward if you will and it points towards Ragnarok this threat is becoming more real and then all of a sudden out of nowhere a side character or a companion or, or whoever will be like hey you know how like the f end of the world is coming soon well like, like, let's forget about that for a bit let's just go chase this random animal you don't have to do this kind of stuff just to keep my mind off ragnarok you know stuff like that will literally happen and i think it deflates a lot of the escalation and the rising tension that ragnarok could theoretically do so well now we could sit here and pick apart all of the different plot threads and different details within this giant convoluted mess of a story and i say mess not because it's actually written poorly or anything and that's not the case at all it's just so clear that there's too much content for one game there are so many things that need to happen that this really should have been two different titles in order to properly set up and just let these plot elements breathe a little bit. I really feel like Heimdall could have been the villain of the second game, and obviously this Ragnarok, this threat in the background, would have been the Act 3 payoff in the final game of the trilogy. And I think Heimdall is fantastic. I love his writing and his implementation in this game. They really make you hate him, and the satisfying payoff when you do fight him as Kratos is like one of the best and most memorable moments in Ragnarok. However, it's just set up and resolves too quickly in my opinion it's so clear that you know they got to rush it along because they got to get through everything there's so much to do it reminds me a lot of Avengers Endgame where there are too many different characters and plot threads going on where nobody really gets the proper amount of screen time that they deserve everything is clearly compressed into this like package that they have to tell it all in if they had separated this into two games I feel like the story really could have had the room to to blossom a lot everything happens so fast and the best example are like how quickly Fre uh, Freya actually forgives Kratos for what happened to Balder and everything. It seemed so rushed. Same thing with like uh, Thor and his family drama. There's a lot of really potentially interesting stuff in there that we just didn't spend enough time on whatsoever. The story and plot threads of God of War Ragnarok are so unbelievably bloated. Not to say that any of them are incompetent or poorly written or bad or anything like that. That's not the point. You have a lot of really good plot threads, but you're trying to shove them into like a single container in which none of them actually have the room to be beautiful at all and and that's the the main issue in my opinion the best way to put it i think is that god of war 2018 story is told like a traditional proper three-act structure film right it, it's told like a movie whereas god of war ragnarok is told like episodic television and those of you who have played it will know exactly what I mean, because it's like every single plot thread in the game is like, this is the episode where so-and-so happened.
happens. This is the episode where uh, Kratos and Freya go on an adventure. In this episode, Atreus and Angraboda go on an adventure. In this episode, Atreus and Thor have, you know what I mean? It's like, there are like 40 different plot threads and scaffolds that this game attempts to follow, and they're all only vaguely connected through this like kind of arbitrary threat that is Ragnarok. Other than that, like no plot detail seems to have any more weight than anything else, and it, it, it doesn't really give me a good sense of the stakes really until up and until the very end and I don't think that was necessarily for the better I feel like that is the downside of having too much content for one game I can understand them not wanting to make two games for this and maybe wanting to fit it all in a single title but it has its drawbacks and this is certainly one of them I actually feel like Infinity War and Endgame are actually solid comparisons here because they're both similarly structured and respectively each title has like a very good setup in almost like perfect amount of screen time for all of the story material given and then in the finale they're just rushing to the end and yes there is like a lot of really great moments throughout that for sure but it could have been greater if it had a little more room to breathe now I want to say a few positive things about the story because I don't want to feel as if I'm coming off as overly critical about it I absolutely love all of the Thor and Odin stuff uh, the actual dynamic between them and then the drama in their family was some of the more interesting stuff in the game in my eyes I love the characterization of Heimdall he's one of my favorite villains uh, in a long time I think he was fantastic in this I just wish he had more screen time I absolutely love the dynamic between Kratos and Atreus here Atreus is growing up and there's so many excellent moments of Kratos being satisfied that he's becoming more independent by himself and 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 taking responsibility there are moments where Kratos wholeheartedly admits that he had been wrong this heartfelt moment just before you walk back through the portal seems so innocuous but it's one of the most touching moments in the game for sure. But in my eyes, I think Sindri steals the show. The way he falls into absolute despair after Brock's death and his character completely changes. He's no longer the like silly kind of goofy lighthearted uh, fun guy anymore. He's completely devastated and overtaken by despair. And I think that's a very realistic depiction that's fair to do. And I think it was handled with grace for that kind of like heavy material. And I also love Kratos' characterization and the way that he learns to open his heart to it. Accepting his past yet still being determined to be better for the sake of our children is an incredibly inspiring message I'm sure a lot of people can relate to. On a side note, I also just love Odin's depiction here. I love the performance. He's just like kind of like a, a, a chill guy, you know, like he's not chill, obviously, but I think his depiction, he's not like, you know, the, the Marvel depiction whatsoever. And I think this direction for it was perfect for the tone and material of this story in particular. I could go on for hours gushing about so many different moments in this game and characters that I love and story beats that were fantastic, but needless to say, I want to keep this segment short. Needless to say, though, it's a fantastic game and a great entertainment experience at that, and there's so many moments to love. You'll never, ever be not entertained by it. That is for sure. However, there are a few things that I don't like about the story, too, or I guess just questions that I have or things that I think are kind of silly or I didn't buy it. Not going to make a big deal out of this, but I don't really like Faye's depiction in Ragnarok. I was perfectly okay with in 2018 not seeing her at all. I felt it left it up to the imagination and it gave them a lot of room to allow the story to grow. But I think, you know, making her tangible, putting her in a body in, in Kratos' dream sequences and also like trying to vaguely set up what she wanted, which is not clear whatsoever. Her role in the prophecy is confusing and convoluted at best. Uh, I, I It's not a giant deal, but but I don't particularly like Faye's role in Ragnarok. I just think she worked better as a plot device in 2018 than an actual character in Ragnarok, but that's just a personal thing of mine, I think. Also, for as much as I like Heimdall as a character, I think the way that we kill him is kind of dumb. Uh, like, obviously, the, apparently the only way to deal damage to him is to use the drop near spear, which is some kind of, like, special, mystical, magical, ancient weapon. All right, fair enough. So, so uh, according to Brock, the only way that this works is because it overwhelms his senses, which is confusing at best but okay um and so you throw the spear at him and he catches it and he's like ha huh, that was dumb but then it blows up and that catches him off guard but then wouldn't he just know that the spears are gonna blow up from that point on or, or whatever i mean like 
hell, even Stevie Wonder could see that was going to happen. It just doesn't make any sense. And, like, uh, you know, if it's about overwhelming his senses, couldn't you send, like, a, a billion Draugr at him that, you know, he can't out dodge all of them sure maybe one on one but couldn't you send even like five people at him at the same time i mean hell atreus freya and kratos alone could probably deal with him even if he can dodge stuff it just doesn't make any sense there wasn't that moment where i felt like aha we we cracked the code it was like okay this magical thing will work why because we said so regardless it was still a fantastic fight and one of the most memorable moments in the game but i just felt that the reasoning of how we got to beat him was kind of silly uh and also i don't really love odin's motivation either like he finds this green crack in the universe that apparently like has the answers to life or whatever for a god i don't know where i go when i go there's no Valhalla for me. Ragnarok um, cannot be why not? the end. Did Cory Barlock's coffee say this? you can't go? He wants all knowledge in the universe or whatever, but it, does that necessarily conflict with Ragnarok? Or, you know, couldn't he just find the mask himself and look in the thing? And, like, would that really change the whole world? Or would he just, like, know stuff? I don't know. I just didn't buy it. To me, all it felt like was a contrived excuse that we can have more Atreus levels and so that he can go on adventures with Thor and find a thing that ultimately really has no purpose or meaning to the overall plot. So I, I think the mask was one of the weakest elements of it. And I think the worst part of it for me was this whole confusion about the prophecy because that was the central tension in the game. And the most interesting stuff was the fact that, okay, Loki was going to serve Odin. He was going to go to Asgard to serve him and become like his second hand man. And Kratos was going to die. Like that's a huge deal. And that was the most interesting tension and, and plot point that the game had been following and the prophecy was from you know the giants and fey and also even the norns who are like the the arbiters of all things that's going to happen in the universe i mean like they could you know see kratos and fey coming from a mile away knew everything that was going to happen or had already happened and for some reason they felt like they couldn't defy destiny even though at the end they do but that doesn't really track because there was no destiny defying moment you could argue that the moment in which Kratos Kratos defied Destiny is his choice not to kill Thor, but that doesn't really make sense either because that was just in Kratos' character anyways. I mean, like, he tried to spare Heimdall, and that didn't work. You know, he gave him no other choice, and it worked with Thor. He wasn't going to kill him, but that didn't seem like the aha moment where everything changed. And if that was the defying moment, then it was actually Thor who was the hero, not Kratos or Atreus. It was Thor who defied destiny, but that's not clear. He just dies, and then that's that. So it's a little bit not clear, and I don't think it was set up very well. This whole thing with the prophecy just felt like a very fake way to build tension, especially considering where it went. If I'm just going to say it. This is my opinion. If they had actually decided to kill off Kratos, at the end of Ragnarok and they did it in like the best way possible where only he could prevent Ragnarok from happening there was no other choice and that was like you know a sacrifice to save everybody I would have been fine with that and it would have made this story significantly more memorable uh, because it feels like you get underhanded a little bit in terms of the weight of the story it's just like oh the prophecy just didn't happen why um, because we defied destiny somewhere, somehow, and that moment was not very clear to us. The only real major character protagonist death at all is Brock, and I love Brock. I think he's a phenomenal character in God of War, but it's, you know, it's not Kratos, and I think that there's a little bit more they could have done to make this story impactful and memorable if they really wanted to end this Norse saga on a bang, because as far as I can tell, I don't think they're making a, a, a sequel to Ragnarok, or at least insofar as, like, this story's concerned. Sure, they'll probably do more God of War stuff, but not in this vein. You know, I bet you Sony Santa Monica is cooking on that Atreus game, but that is also the problem is like, because Kratos is still alive, everybody just wants to do Kratos stuff. Nobody wants to invest heavily in Atreus' story when they know that Kratos is still around. We want to know what's going on with him. He's the reason people got into God of War. And I do feel that if they had killed off Kratos, there is a chance that maybe people would find it in their heart to be invested in what Atreus is doing. But I just don't see that being the case if Kratos is still around. And I'm not saying it would be the right decision to kill him off, but if they had done that, I would have had some respect. I mean, hell, the DLC stuff with Valhalla feels like a proper end to Kratos, and we'll get there.
there, but that actually feels like something that could have been like, okay, let's put a neat little bow on this and wrap it up and that be the end. And it would have been a beautiful moment. That's what the actual DLC feels like. And so if they had, you know, complemented that in the main game, it would have made this story significantly more memorable and impactful. And it seems like they're a little bit wishy-washy right now on which direction they want to go with all this. Now I'll leave the story alone for a moment. I want to shift gears over to gameplay because Ragnarok made many improvements to its core gameplay and combat compared to 2018 or a lot of the complaints that I had about that game were immediately alleviated here. Not all of them but a fair amount. Right away they introduced a mechanic that I very much enjoy that gives me an incentive to play well in combat which is this like manual controllable extra elemental damage that will be applied to your weapon if you don't get hit and you're dealing consecutive damage. This small change is absolutely awesome for the pace of combat. It harkens back to the proper combo counter in God of War and it gives you an actual moment to moment incentive to play well and get better and that was something that I cannot praise enough. I was just thrilled to see that. Plus there's a bunch of expanded mechanics for combat itself. You can actually do some air stuff now and even drop down from high places dealing like this ground slam attack. Realistically you're not going to use it that often but it's neat when you have the opportunity to do so. But one of my favorite features is being able to charge your weapon on your own manually. Like you can hold triangle, you can buff up your frost axe temporarily, or you can spin up the blades of chaos to do all kinds of different cool combo trees with it. It's fantastic. This is a big improvement to a lot of the stuff in 2018. And not to mention, once again, that runic attacks, both light and heavy, have been heavily tuned and modified to not be so broken. I think in, in 2018, they were by far like the best thing to use in combat, and they are beneficial here, but they're not an end-all be-all option. And I wanted to point out the fact of how much better the UI is laid out and organized in Ragnarok. It's a complete overhaul of the previous system, which is done for the better. Also, the amulets, I much prefer, you know, unlocking these different slots than the enchantment system back in 2018. Something that is kind of funny because Ragnarok is such a, a more expanded and bloated game than 2018 is there's a far more items and equipment in the game, and that means there is some crazy hack silver inflation going on. When I first started playing Ragnarok, you earn much more hack silver from, you know, stuff like chests or puzzles or whatever, even like combat encounters, and you think you're making a lot of money because like a few thousand hack silver in 2018 is pretty valuable, where in Ragnarok, it's really not at all. And so this caught me off guard at first, but it made sense because of how many other items are in the game. The hack silver inflation does kind of go crazy over in the nine realms. But I do want to quickly talk about the progression and skill tree behavior because it's basically the same as 2018. Although I have to say the drawback is you spend a majority of Ragnarok re-unlocking skills that you already got in 2018. It's like Kratos forgot how to do these things in between then. I don't know. I do wish that there was maybe different things on the skill tree and you already started with the kit that you left off with in 2018 but that's just my opinion to sum everything up it's significantly more streamlined organized clean and to the point and i'm always a big fan of that very user friendly and they took tons of lessons from what they learned in their original design and i think that is progression that's improvement and i give them credit all day for that as far as level design goes it mirrors the philosophy of god of war 2018 uh, a lot and you know you have these linear levels with puzzles scattered throughout them and the puzzles are better in Ragnarok even though a lot of them I still wouldn't classify as a puzzle they are more intricate they're more thoughtful and depthful and overall I feel like they are a progression of that system the levels still can ultimately feel very samey outside of their aesthetics they have the same kind of traversal mechanics and you know the one path progression and so on and while we're on the topic we need to talk about the Atreus levels and this is obviously a controversial feature of Ragnarok and I think for good reason because I do feel to some extent it's a testing grounds for something if they had made an Atreus dedicated game but if they were to do that I don't feel like they would just make a full game you know handling and piloting Atreus as he's presented in Ragnarok I think the game would be far different but it's just proof of concept the thing with Atreus is that specifically in this style of God of War with this like over the shoulder cam and, and the combat pacing and the way that encounters work I think Atreus mechanically works better than Kratos when I say that I don't
don't mean the Atreus levels are better. I'm not saying Kratos isn't fun. All I'm saying is that these mechanics, uh, specifically this over the shoulder look, is more suited to like a shooter or something ranged. And Atreus's kit is all about range and you're taking enemies from far away and the way that the crosshair specifically works feels like it was made for that kind of game. And so I, I'm not saying that Atreus should get his own game or anything of the sort. My only observation is that it's incredibly intuitive to pick up and it feels smooth. Even if you don't like the Atreus levels, fundamentally you got to admit that the mechanics actually work quite nicely and complementary to God of War's mechanics, specifically this new God of War system. And I, I can't say that I really enjoy the Atreus levels all that much. In fact, I found them really boring as the game started to go on. I think the first time it's, you know, a neat switch up. We're never used to playing as Atreus. He's always the companion. And then putting us in the pilot of him was really cool. But once the novelty wore off, having like five or six more levels where it's just the same old Atreus stuff, I will admit did get boring. And maybe on my first time, not as much. On second and repeat New Game Plus playthroughs, I really started to just mentally check out every time I was doing an Atreus mission. And they're non-skippable, which is the worst part. If these were optional or, you know, side content for the most part, outside of maybe the first two Atreus missions, I would be more okay with that. But I think shoving them down your throat if you want to participate in the main story it just feels so tedious and you're just begging to get back to the Kratos stuff. At least that's how I felt anyways. It was fine, but it does overstay its welcome. Like I said, mechanically it works fine, and I almost wonder if they had designed this God of War combat system specifically with that in mind at some point. I don't really know. That's speculation, but I think it works incredibly well from a purely mechanical standpoint. I just don't find the Treus levels to be that fun at all. But thankfully, it's only a relatively small portion of the game, even though I say that, it still ends up being like seven hours or so out of the, you know, slated 35 hours that it takes somebody to complete the game. So it's it's a lot still, but regardless, if you're doing anything outside of main content, there are plenty of insane bosses and really fun side stuff to participate in. And I think the level design, obviously I was talking about its linearity. There is one level in the game that's totally optional that's found in a random side quest that is genuinely some of the best level design I think God of War has ever had. And I think you know where I'm going with this. It's the area called the Crater. What I love about it is I felt like a lot of the main levels could have done with this design philosophy. You have this one thing set up right from the very get-go. You have, oh my god, this is, there's a dragon and we got to go save this guy. So you have this goal to work towards, but you have like so many different options to get there. It's extremely non-linear in its design. You can approach it any way you want. There's all kinds of fun secrets and little side things to discover along your journey that don't feel like they're taking you too far out of the way from your goal. And the main reason I love it is the thing I've been harping on the entire time in this video. This is like the first level in the game period that includes 2018 and Ragnarok where I felt like it finally let me off the rails and gave me some player agency. Most of the main campaign missions are, you know, they're going to be very, very linear levels with not much you can do to deviate in any kind of creative way or how you approach it. The puzzles have to be solved in a very particular order and fashion and so on. But in the crater, that is not the case at all. You have your one main goal, which is go defeat the dragon and save the guy. But how you get there is completely up to you. And I just wish there was more of that stuff in the game. I think a lot of the main levels could have been designed with this in mind. Maybe we have less overall levels, but there are more free form like this. This is what I was looking for in terms of player agency. And even the crater is still a little bit tame compared to what I would say is like a true free form sandbox level, but it's a step in the right direction. And if they had split this Norse saga into a trilogy, maybe the third game could have been centered around this kind of level philosophy. And I would have been a giant fan of that, but it's a shame we only have it in this one particular scenario, but it's a very special level to me. And I think it elevates Ragnarok a lot. Now, God of War Ragnarok does have a far expanded roster of main bosses and mini bosses. That's partly due to the amount of story that needs to be told and the main consequential bosses that come alongside it. But there are plenty of optional boss battles, including the dragon from the crater or all of the berserker fights, which are equivalent to the Valkyries in God of War 2018. And I would even say the berserkers are better in a lot of ways, and I prefer this combat system. It just seems like they really found their footing with the enemy balance and 
and combat style that Ragnarok was trying to accomplish. And thankfully, there isn't, you know, this incessant reuse of a single mini boss at any given time. In retrospect, God of War 2018 and its constant reuse of certain mini bosses is a blemish on the overall product when we're looking back on it. And Ragnarok thankfully alleviates that problem entirely. I never felt fatigue with fighting certain mini bosses, even if they are repeated throughout the game. The side bosses and main are dynamic enough that the rest of the roster maintains itself to be fun, fresh, and interesting throughout the entire experience. I have absolutely no complaints with the boss battle design or anything of the sort in Ragnarok, even though in God of War 2018 they were pretty good, all things considered, but we have to admit that there was a lot of reuse throughout that game. Not too long ago, God of War got a free DLC expansion called Valhalla, and this is a roguelite mode that takes the God of War combat systems and bosses and puts them into an actual campaign. It's story driven, like this stuff is part of Kratos' arc and his character, like Mimir is here, Freya is as well, Tyr is also included, and so Valhalla, you have small chunks of levels throughout the locations you visited in Ragnarok, and as you get closer to the end of each mission, you will end up back in ancient Greece, where Kratos came from, and you get to deal with these areas again, and there's actually a few enemy types from those older games that have been added in here too. At the end of each cycle, you will fight Tyr, and if you happen to die up to this point getting to Tyr, you will reset back at the beginning of Valhalla. You'll go and repeat this cycle over and over again until you gather enough currency to get different stat altering effects or runics on your weapon or relics applied to your character and so on. You upgrade yourself at the beginning of each match to go into the next one a little bit more prepared and stronger, and you need to fight Tyr a total of four separate times at the end to eventually get the final ending in which Kratos faces himself. I think the Valhalla DLC is fantastic, and it really crystallizes God of War systems in combat in a way that allows you to experiment with all kinds of game settings, difficulties, and even weapons and their abilities and stuff, because all of the tools uh, of the game are at your disposal throughout the levels and the upgrades that you choose to put on. You can make the experience difficult for yourself, or you can wait to fully upgrade your character and stuff like that. The, the experience is completely up to you, and it makes it so you can fight a handful and variety of enemies, some of God of War's best, in a very short amount of time. You know, because some of my favorite boss fights in God of War, I either have to get to that moment in the story to play it, or I need to play it where it's located in its respective side quest. But in Valhalla, you fight like a giant variety of enemies in a very short period of time. So if you just want to play around and kill enemies and, and just do combat stuff, I, I don't think it gets any better than this. And again, you can tune the experience to how you want it to be exactly. It can be insanely hard if you don't want to upgrade yourself too much, or you can make it easy and just stomp through everything. The, the choice is yours. The story implications in Valhalla are neat. Like, it's really cool going to the areas of Kratos' past and even encountering some of the people that he, you know, like Helios replaces Mimir for a little while, and you get to see his perspective, uh, you know, talking on Kratos' back. It's just fun stuff, and I feel Valhalla was in some ways trying to encapsulate the old fun spirit of the original God of War series, uh, and then recontextualizing it for Ragnarok. I think they did a great job with it, and I still find myself really enjoying it to this day. Not to mention, upon completing Valhalla, you get access to the young Kratos skin that can be used in that game mode and the main game as well, which I'm sure you've noticed throughout this video. Uh, it's an excellent addition to Ragnarok. The fact is, they probably just looked at Hades and said, yo, we're going to do this, but in our game. And I, that's completely fine as far as I'm concerned, because it seems to complement this game systems well. And for what it's worth, they made an excellent experience that again, just allows you to enjoy the fun parts of the combat without needing to go through all of the story elements or hunting down side quest stuff. Uh, it's very crystallized and streamlined. And I think it's a beautiful capstone that ends off Ragnarok on a high note. From a story standpoint, I'm not being hyperbolic, it genuinely feels like the end of Kratos, the way that Valhalla wraps up, and I have no clue what they plan on doing with that from here, because this felt like a finale, and so if this is truly how they wanted to end Kratos' story, then I think that's fair enough and it's done in a pretty tasteful way, but if they're planning on continuing it, then it's a little more confusing, but I guess we'll have to wait and see.
Hey guys, before we wrap this up, I just want to say if you've made it this far in the video, thank you so much. These are my passion and your guys' support allows me to continue to make these videos as good as they can possibly be. I'm a one-man show, I'm my own editor, producer, writer, etc. And it's only thanks to your guys' support that I'm able to really take my time and make these videos excellent for you. So if you would like to support these and see them continue, consider becoming a channel member. I will start putting the list of all my members at the end of every single video. If you want to be included in this content, it's a great way to do so. But either way, thank you for your support. God of War as a franchise has seen a massive comeback in the public eye, in cultural relevance, and in sales. The Norse Saga games have proven to be huge hits with the mainstream audience, and in a lot of ways, it's no wonder why that is. They are truly technical and cinematic masterpieces with a really solid game to go alongside them. It's clear that these games were designed with accessibility in mind, which does limit the potential that these both could have had as video games, in my opinion. That's of course not to say that the games aren't both both phenomenal, 2018 completely redefined where God of War could go, and Ragnarok improved on that formula. Whether or not this should have been three games instead of two can always be debated, but I love both of these games so much that I'm just happy that we got these in the first place. They're absolutely not perfect, and there's many things that I would have done differently, but I believe it's safe to conclude that both God of War 2018 and Ragnarok deserve to be called a masterpiece when taking the big picture into account. Who knows what's next for Kratos? and the God of War brand? Will we get remakes of the old God of War games or a brand new Atreus title? It's too, you know, lucrative and insignificant for Sony Santa Monica to put it away entirely, so I'm sure it will continue on in some fashion. I just hope whatever's next, they can learn from these and make the best possible video game for God of War going forward, and to not be sorry about any of the mistakes of the past, but to be better.